All right, so let's start today's lecture. Okay, so in the last lecture, you learned about uh, simple harmonic motion. And to understand the simple harmonic motion, we use the mass uh, spring mass system. Okay, now simple pendulum is another example of the simple harmonic motion. Okay, here I'm going to um, briefly talk about simple pendulum. Okay, and then I will talk about wave. Okay. So what is the simple pendulum? Simple pendulum is basically this one. Um, okay, so this is a basically a simple pendulum. It should have a mass and it should be, um, uh, I mean, hanged from somewhere. Okay, and this is attached, uh, this mass should be attached with the string or the rope. So this is the rope, this is the mass and it is fixed somewhere. Okay. And here you see that um, if you uh, uh, I mean if you displace the mass, okay, it, it will be oscillating back and forth. Okay, and back on back and forth motion is basically the simple harmonic motion. Okay. All right. Now um Let's talk in, a little bit in details about uh, the motion of a simple pendulum, okay? So to understand this, we have to draw the free body diagram. And here we draw the free body diagram. And you see that uh, we have tension force. So this is the tension force. Um, okay, so this is the tension force. This is the gravity, okay? Now, this is our coordinate system, okay? Now, here you see that the uh, tension force is along the y direction, but gravity is neither along the y and x, okay? So, the, the solution is when there is a force which is neither along the x and y direction is to break this uh, vector into its x and y component. So, we break this into its x and y component, okay? So, this is the x component and this is the y component. Okay, now here what you see that this force is um, along this direction and we can call this force as the restoring force. Okay, why we can call it restoring force? Because uh, this is the force uh, for which it goes back to its original position. So this is the original position. I mean, this vertical line is the original position or the equilibrium position of this mass, right? So this minus mg sine theta is towards this line. And because of this, it goes back to its um, equilibrium position. And that's why we can call it um, restoring force. Okay. Now, Earlier, when we learn about the Hooke's law, we see that restoring force is proportional to the displacement. So here, theta is the angular displacement, right? But here you see that the restoring force is not equal, to, not proportional to the uh, angular displacement, okay? It is proportional to the sine theta, okay? Now, if it is not proportional to sine, uh, proportional to the displacement here, angular displacement, it cannot be the simple harmonic motion. Okay, so we have to approximate it. Okay, and the approximation is when theta is less than fifteen degree, then it could be a simple harmonic motion. Why? Because when theta is less than fifteen degree in radian, sine theta is actually almost equal to theta, okay? So let me show you here, okay? So in this table, you see that when sine theta, I mean, when theta is one degree, uh, uh, theta in radian is this one, and you see that the sine theta is almost equal to, actually exactly equal to um, theta. Five degree, almost equal to theta. Okay, 10 degree, almost equal to theta. 15 degree, uh, yeah, is very close, 1.1 degree difference. But uh, after that, there will be the, uh, the difference will be higher. Okay, so that's why when theta is less than 15 degree, okay, we can treat the motion of this mass, okay, simple pendulum as simple harmonic motion. Okay, so remember that to become simple harmonic motion, the theta here must be 
less than equal uh, less than uh, 15 degree okay all right now if it is less than 15 degree okay then we can write sine theta is almost approximately equal to theta so f the restoring force you can write approximately equal to mg theta okay now using the geometry you can write mg okay theta is equal to x over l so x here is uh this length and l is the length of the string okay now uh if we compare this equation with f equal to kx okay then you can write that k so here we don't call it the spring constant uh rather we call it the effective force constant k is actually equal to then m g over l okay now for simple harmonic uh, for simple pendulum we basically interested on the frequency and the time period okay so we can write the frequency from this equation so remember that we have the frequency equation from the uh, uh, the spring mass system and it was something like this k over m okay now if you replace k it will be something like this mg over l times m so m m cancel out so it is 1 over 2 pi m over l okay so the frequency of the simple pendulum is this one and the reciprocal of the frequency is the time period so the time period will be 1 over f and it will be equal to 2 pi l over m ah sorry uh sorry uh it is not m it is actually g so it will be g l over g okay mm cancel out so there should be g okay so basically we are interested on the frequency and the time period of the simple pendulum okay so here this is the frequency equation and this is the time period equation all right okay now the next thing i'm going to talk is the damped harmonic motion okay so i mean uh, in uh, last lecture and here in a simple pendulum we actually neglected the uh, neglected the air resistance and the friction okay but what happen if there is a friction if there is air resistance okay so let's see what happen okay so normally if there is no uh, if there is no uh, friction if there is no air resistance the you know uh, so for example for uh, this uh, simple pendulum you can see that uh, it is basically a uh, sinusoidal wave right so here you see that the sinusoidal wave and the amplitude is always uh, fixed right so amplitude is basically the uh, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position okay but if there is air resistance if there is a friction here you see that that amplitude is not constant so amplitude decreases exponentially so here you see that right amplitude decreases exponentially so when amplitude decreases exponentially something like this we call it damped harmonic oscillation okay so here you can also see that okay now i'm not going to discuss the uh, mathematical detail of that but uh, some conceptual things you need to know okay so there are three types of damping one is under damping critical damping and over damping okay so here what you see is basically the under damping so in under damping you still see the oscillation although the amplitude decreases exponentially but you still see the oscillation okay so here you see that but there are two other damping over damping and critical damping there you don't see the uh, oscillation okay so uh here 
So A is basically the under damping and B is the critically damping and C is the over damping. So in critically damping case and the over damping case, you don't see the oscillation. Okay. Now what you see is um, um, in B and C, or I mean, in other words, what is the difference between the critical damping and the over damping? The difference is critically damping goes to the equilibrium position. I mean, in this line very quickly. Okay. On the other hand, over damping, it takes time to go to the uh, equilibrium position. So here you see that um, over damping. Okay. So it takes long time to go to the equilibrium position. Okay. So here you see that uh, it takes like about two, uh, 14 seconds, for example, for this example. Okay. On the other hand, critical damping, you can see it will go quickly to the equilibrium position. Actually, let's uh, reset it. Uh, over damping. Okay, so it takes long time, okay? On the other hand, you can see for critical damping, it goes very quickly to the equilibrium position. Yeah, so you see that. So here is basically 2.8. All right, so now um, in some system, we actually want um, damping. In some system, we don't want damping. For example, in clock, I mean, spring clock or watches, we do not want damping, okay? But there are many other systems. For example, in automobile, in building, okay, we want um, the damping, okay? Actually, we want uh, the system come back to its original or equilibrium position as soon as possible. For example, when you bump something, I mean, when you drive a car and bump something, yeah, right? It oscillate, but you want your car to back to get back to its um, normal position as soon as possible. Okay, so that's why in car, I mean, the engineer or mechanic use this kind of thing. We call it the shock absorber. Okay, when there is some oscillation because of this. Okay, and it is designed such a way that it comes back to the normal position as soon as possible. So that means they use the critical damping condition here in the shock, shock absorber. Okay, same thing in the earthquake uh, protection in the building. Okay, so you want the building, you know, that building oscillates. Okay, uh, when there is earthquake, it oscillates more. Okay, now we want, we don't want uh, the building to oscillate for a long time, then it will break, right? So you want the building to come back its equilibrium position as soon as possible. And that's why this kind of earthquake productions are used in a building. Okay, all right. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about the force vibration and resonance. Okay, all right, so we're done with this one, we're done with this one, we're done with this one. All right, so to understand the forced vibration, okay, let's use this example, okay? So forced vibration means um, on top of a, uh, a system's natural vibration, if you force the system uh, to vibrate, then um, then what happened, okay? So for example, uh, the we have three springs here, spring mass system, okay? They have their natural frequency. Right, natural frequency you can determine from this equation. Um, so, so if you know the K and M, you can determine the uh, natural frequency, right? So let me show you how to determine the natural frequency. Um, okay, I can, I think I can do it here. Okay. Okay. So, you know that the, uh, the frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi k over m, 
right so this is the definition of the frequency when we have a spring mass system so we know the mass we know the spring constant we know the mass so if you plug these two values here in this equation you will see that the frequency for this one is closely i mean approximately equal to uh, 0 0.80 hertz okay for this one it will be about 1.13 hertz and for this one it will be about 1.59 hertz okay so that means uh, they are the natural frequency okay so uh, if there is uh, if we let them uh, oscillate they will be oscillating with these frequencies and here you see there is a something which actually force this spring to vibrate okay and you can change the frequency of this force vibration by using these okay now let's say let's use from a small uh, frequency for the uh, for the uh, for the force vibration okay so this is the force vibration this is the frequency of the force vibration so if we let it run it's basically is nothing basically happening i mean it's oscillating okay but nothing terrible is going uh, is happening here right okay now let's increase the frequency of the force vibration to close to 0.8 hertz okay Let's see what happened. Yes, I mean, because of the higher frequency, they, uh, they are oscillating a little bit um, uh, with higher amplitude, okay? But on top of this, you see that this one is oscillating terribly, right? With higher um, amplitude. The first one. Right? So it tells us that when the natural frequency matches with the uh, forced, uh, uh, the frequency of the forced vibration, the system actually oscillates uh, with higher amplitude. Okay, so here you see that the, the second and third one is not that bad. But the first one is oscillating with higher uh, higher amplitude. Okay. Let's try the second one then. Okay. So now let's increase the frequency of the forced vibration to 1.13 hertz. Now you will see that the first and third one will not that bad. But the second one will be uh, oscillating with higher amplitude. So you see that. Okay. And then the last one is this one, 1.59. So now you will see that first and second are not that bad, but the third one is terribly oscillating with higher amplitude, right? So this is basically the forced vibration. So you see that forced vibration is basically when you have something else uh, that force the system to vibrate. Okay, and forced vibration is not that bad when the frequency of the forced vibration are other than the natural frequency. When the frequency of the forced vibration other than the natural frequency is not that bad, okay? But when the natural frequency matches with the frequency of the forced vibration, the system actually oscillate with, with a huge amplitude, okay? You see this from this simulation, okay? Now, let me come back to here. Okay, now if you see this graph,
So here you see that the amplitude, okay? So this is the running frequency. So this is the running frequency of the force vibration. So when it is not, and this is the natural frequency, when the running frequency uh, are not close to uh, natural frequencies, you see that they are not that bad. But when it is equal to the natural frequency, the amplitude, you see that it is huge, okay? Now, what is the, uh, what is the problem of having huge uh, amplitude? you um you see that destruction can happen so when system oscillate with huge amplitude you know that failure can happen okay so here you see that this breeze and these breeze they have their natural frequency and this breeze due to the wind and this breeze due to the earthquake um at some point in uh, these dates okay uh, destruction happen Okay, so why destruction happen here? Because of the natural frequency and the frequency of the wind here and the um, frequency of the earthquake matches with the natural frequency. And because of that, they are oscillating with a huge amplitude and breaks and uh, that causes this de destruction. Okay. All right, so when uh, the natural frequency matches with the uh, uh, frequency of the force vibration, we call it resonance. So this is basically an example of the resonance. Okay. All right. All right, now the next thing I'm going to talk is basically uh, the wave, okay? Wave and wave motion, okay? Wave and oscillations are somehow related, okay? Oscillation creates actually a wave, okay? So for example, when you throw a stone on the lake water or when you shake a, a rope, you basically create a wave, okay? In water, water wave, in rope is the rope wave. Okay, so in in wave, the wave particle actually goes up and down, but the wave propagate forward. So when wave propagate, basically energy transfer from one particle to another particle. Okay, the particle does uh, particles don't move. Okay, energy basically moves when the wave propagate in the forward direction. So for example, here the uh, uh, the rope particle is basically going up and down, but the wave moving forward. All right, so um, here you can see, so, so you can oscillate a rope or a string to create a wave, okay? All right. Now, um, some terminology here we need to understand, okay? So amplitude, we already know amplitude, right? Amplitude is basically the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position, okay? So here in this exa uh, in this wave, so this is the equilibrium position. And from here to here, this is the amplitude or from here to here, this is the amplitude, okay? Here we also call the, uh, the peak in the positive direction, we call crest and peak in the negative direction, we call trough, okay? All right, wavelength, okay? So wavelength is basically the distance between two successive crests or two successive traps or in general, two successive identical points on the wave, okay? So for example, so two successive crest or two successive trap or two successive similar points on the wave, okay? Or in other words, this is the length of a full wave. One full wave is basically the wavelength. Okay, so from here to here, you can think it as a one, one wave or from here to here, this you can think as a one wave. Okay, all right. Frequency, you also know. Frequency is basically the number of crest or complete cycle or complete wave that pass a given point per second. Okay, period. Period is basically the reciprocal of the frequency, F equal to one over T. You uh, see this equation several times in this course, okay? Here, it is the time um, elapsed by one um, full wave to pass a point, okay? Now, wave speed, 
okay so you earlier we already learned about the speed right so uh what is the wave speed so with this we can determine the wave speed okay okay let me show you what is the wave speed okay so earlier you learn about this equation uh speed v equal to distance okay over time so this is the definition of a speed now let's say this is our and this is our wave okay now from here to here it is the wavelength right lambda so this is basically the distance or distance for one full wave right and then so this is lambda and the time for this one full wave to pass a point is the time period right so we can write as this right and we know that one over t is the frequency so we can write these so the wave speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency okay all right now there are two types of waves transverse wave and longitudinal waves so this the first example is the transverse wave and the second example is the longitudinal wave okay so in transverse wave wave propagates in this direction wave propagates in this direction and uh, oscillates in this direction okay oscillates up and down and propagates in the forward direction so what you see here the oscillation is in this direction and propagation is in this direction that means they are perpendicular to each other when the oscillation and the propagation are perpendicular to each other they are the transverse wave and the some example of the transverse wave is the rope wave ocean wave okay and then another type of wave is the uh, the longitudinal wave in longitudinal wave the propagation is in this direction and the oscillation is also in this direction when they are parallel we call it longitudinal wave okay sound wave is an example of um, longitudinal wave okay so uh, so yeah i have some example here you can see that so longitudinal wave so here you can see so the the first one is the transverse uh, longitudinal wave second one is the transverse wave okay all right um, <clears throat> so in longitudinal wave you see that there is compression so compression and expansion so compression and expansion happen and that's why it propagates forward okay so when we talk okay we actually create a pressure on the air column in front of us okay and that creates actually compression and expansion and that's how the sound wave propagate okay sound wave is an example of the longitudinal wave so here you can see that okay so you create sound on the drum okay and and that creates the pressure in front of the air column okay and that pressure actually creates a compression and expansion okay and this compression and this expansion are basically uh, equivalent to the the crest and trough in a transverse wave okay so here you see that so this is the compression uh, compression compression is uh, equivalent to uh, crest and this is expansion and the expansion is equivalent to trough okay now if we want to know what is the wavelength of a uh, longitudinal wave is basically this from one um, one uh, compression to another compression or one expansion to another expansion okay so you know that crest to crest or trough to trough so it's basically the same thing so this is basically the wavelength of a longitudinal wave all right now uh, the wave speed again okay wave speed uh, depends on the medium okay now for a rope wave or a string wave uh, that is basically the tension on the rope so this is the tension on the rope and this is the length density okay so the den length density is basically the mass per unit length which is again the property of the medium okay so if you want to know the uh, speed of a rope wave 
we have to know what is the tension on the rope and also we need to know what is the uh, the mass per unit length okay on the other hand for longitudinal wave okay if it is through solid object okay then it is very similar to uh, so this equation but here we have to replace the tension by the elastic modulus so this is the elastic modulus and this is the volume density so mass per unit volume okay and if it is through the uh, uh, fluid okay liquid or gas then we have to replace the elastic modulus with bulk modulus okay and rho is basically the volume density okay all right now a uh, little bit more about wave so here i'm going to talk a little bit about reflection and transmission of waves okay in the physics 2 you'll be learning more about reflection and transmission or refraction of waves when you learn about the optics okay but uh, in general uh, when a wave strikes an obstacle or comes to end of the medium in which it is traveling at least a part of the wave is reflected so here you see a wave is going through this uh, rope and here you see that we have two types of medium so uh, this is one medium this is another medium why they are two two different medium because you know the because this is the heavy section the length uh, the mass per unit length will be different than this that means they are the two different medium so when it um, i mean reaches this point when the wave reaches this point a part is reflected so here you see that and a part is transmitted okay so here you can see uh, not this one here you can see that so here you see that a wave so let's say you shake the rope so you create a wave and you will see what happened when it reaches to the uh, the other end obstacle okay so here you see the the euro wave the wave you generated is moving forward and this vertical line is the obstacle when it reaches the obstacle here you see that a reflected wave so the blue is the reflected wave okay so the red is the wave you generated and the blue is the reflected wave okay all right now uh, interference and the principle of superposition okay now when we have two waves cross each other okay they are uh, i mean when to, when we have two waves and cross each other there is basically superposition happens okay superposition of the uh, wave happens so what is the superposition means or what is the principle of superposition in this case okay so it is basically adding the amplitude okay um, adding or subtracting the amplitude for example if we have something like this okay so here you see that this one is in the positive side and this one is the negative side when they meet they cancel each other and we see something like this the uh, the combined effect of these two is basically this one but when we have something like this you see that they add here okay and so on so here uh, okay so let me show it here okay so let's say we have uh, this one okay okay so here you see that two waves are, are approaching each other and here you see that the ads okay and then if we have something like this uh, so you will see that they this time uh, they cancel each other so you see that they cancel each other okay so superposition means adding the amplitude okay we'll see a little bit in details in the next few slides okay all right now depending on whether they are adding the amplitude or subtracting the amplitude okay uh, we have two types of interference 
one is the constructive interference another is destructive interference basically i mean uh, i mean this this uh, phenomena we call it interference interference okay when two waves crosses each other or meet each other okay their amplitude adds or uh, we have to subtract the amplitude when you add them then we call it the constructive interference when you subtract them we call it destructive interference okay so for example here these two waves are in phase in phase means the peak meets peak uh, i mean the crest meets crest trough meets trough okay so they are in phase when they are in phase you have to add the amplitudes when they are out of phase out of phase means they are in opposite way so the positive peak meets the negative peak of the other wave then they cancel each other and we see destructive interference something like this okay so this is uh, when they are in phase and this is when they are out of phase and in between in phase and in between cost constructive and destructive interference we can have something like this where it is not exactly meeting the peak so here you see that peak is somewhere here for for this one okay then depending on uh, how much is meeting we have to add or subtract and then you see that we get something like this okay the amplitude is basically in between these two okay all right now based on this interference we now going to learn something called the standing waves okay so what is the standing waves to understand this let's say we have a rope fixed at one end and uh, we can create wave by shaking it okay on the other end okay so when you create a wave when you shake it you basically create a wave so you create a wave it goes in this direction okay when it meets here there will be now reflected wave so you create a wave and then there will be reflected wave right so when there are two waves they meet and then interference happen okay now um, uh, there could be constructive interference there could be destructive interference depending on how they meet okay but on top of that, when we have a wave, uh, when we have a uh, rope fixed at here and here, or something like this situation, we basically see something like this, okay? So it looks basically like that the the combined wave so this is you see that the black one is basically the combination of these two waves the red one is the original wave that basically we created and then blue is basically the uh, reflected wave and then interference happened between the blue and red and we get this one okay the uh, the black one and you see that the red one is going forward okay to the right and blue is going backward that means to the left okay they are traveling but the black one looks like uh, it is uh, standing it's just moving up and down okay so uh, because of this we call uh, this kind of wave as a standing wave okay now here some terminology we need to understand for the standing waves so in standing waves in this and in the fixed end the amplitude is always zero okay so when the amplitude is equal to zero we call them node okay and in between tone two nodes there will be anti-node anti-node means the amplitude is maximum so here amplitude uh, amplitude is maximum so anti-node means amplitude maximum node means um, um, amplitude is zero okay so this is the first or the simplest um, standing wave we can see okay the next simplest one is the two loop standing wave so here this is the one loop standing wave this is the two loops standing wave so in two loop standing wave we have two anti node and three nodes so in between here and here we have one more node here okay and this is the next simplest so this is the three node standing waves so in three node standing waves there will be one two three 
four uh, node and three anti node. Okay. Now, standing wave actually uh, don't happen for all frequencies. Okay, it happened for certain frequencies that I'm going to show in the next slide. Okay, and those frequencies we call the harmonics. Okay, so this is the first harmonic. The frequency of this one is called the first harmonic. The frequency of this one we call the second harmonic. The frequency of this one we call the third harmonic. Okay, and also the frequency of the okay, so let me write down. So this is the first harmonic okay and the, this is the second harmonic and so on the, this is the third harmonic okay on top of that on top of that we call also a the frequency of the simplest standing wave we call the fundamental frequency Okay, and then um, and the second harmonic we also called it fast overtone. Okay, and the third harmonic we call second overtone, and so on. Okay, and all these frequencies we call the resonance. Okay, so I mean, uh, standing wave happens only at the resonance frequencies. Okay, so all these frequencies are basically the resonance frequency for this uh, rope wave. Okay. Now let's say we have this rope L. Now we want to know what is the uh, relationship between the frequency, uh, the higher order frequency, the fundamental frequency, and the wavelength to this length. Okay, so let me now derive it. Okay. Now here you see that this is the simplest um, standing wave, the next simplest one, this one, and then this one, okay? Now the first one, this one looks like a uh, half wave. So normally the a wave is something like this, right? And it looks like half of a wave, okay? So we can write this equation, the length of this rope is equal to half of the wavelength, okay? Here you can write it, uh, it looks like a full wave. So the length is equal to the wavelength of the wave. And this looks like one full wave and then half wave. So uh, one half wavelength. The length of the rope is equal to one half, one and half of the wavelength. Okay. Now here I can write it something like this. Lambda one is equal to two L divided by one. Here you can write it lambda two equal to 2L over 2. Okay, so 2 to cancel out. So it is basically just L. And here we can write it lambda 3 is equal to 2L over 3. Okay, so in general, I can write it something like this. Lambda N equal to 2L over N. N is equal to 1, 2, 3, uh, basically the integer number. Okay, so the wavelength of the, um, the standing wave should satisfy this equation. Okay, now um, from this we can determine the uh, frequency. Okay, and to determine the frequency we need to know the wave speed. So wave speed is equal to something like this. Fn, Ff, the frequency times the wavelength. Okay, now... Uh, if you solve it for Fn, you get this equation, V over lambda N. So let me write down, okay, Fn is equal to V over lambda N. So if you substitute lambda N here, you get V over 2L over N. This is equal to N V over 2L, right? Now, when N equal to 1, so we get F1 equal to V over 2L, right? So this tells us that Fn equal to N times F1, right? If you substitute F1 equal to V over 2L, you get this. So when you know the fundamental frequency F1, 
you can determine all the higher order frequency, all the harmonics, higher order harmonics by just multiplying um, by integer number, right? All right. So basically that's it for this chapter. In the next lecture, I'm going to solve some classwork problem, okay? All right.